Hi, my name's Nick Lines. I'm co-founder, co-CEO of Flawless. What is Flawless AI? We are world's first gen AI filmmaking company. Um, we make software for filmmakers that ultimately reduces uh, production costs and increases audience reach. Why did you co-found Flawless? My co-founder is a Hollywood film director, Scott Mann. He was very aware of the, uh, the pains of the film industry. My background is in technology, so I was fascinated by the technology. But ultimately, we founded the business because we believed at the at core, we believed that sharing global stories would have a positive impact. One of the things that we kind of came to understand was that language is regional, but story is global. And consequently, a good mechanism for people to enjoy stories from all over the world is it will also feed in cultural understanding. Why is this tech better than just redubbing audio in movies and shows? Having watched the world's first AI translated, we engage with the characters differently, then consequently engaging with the characters differently, you actually understand the relationships better, the story is based, makes more sense, and consequently the, you know, the whole thing is much more engaging. And so we've um, been doing many tests, etc. internally, and we watched you know, the majority of basically a movie that had been translated in this way. Um, and it was just like a completely different experience. So we know firsthand, um, and it, we, I think it's for those reasons. Do you think we lose something when we get rid of subtitles? What I say sort of internally and sometimes to investors is, you know, when I'm trying to sort of narrate an understanding of what it is we're trying to achieve, dubbing and subtitling, you know, I don't think it's additive. Um, in the case of um, subtitling, you know, you're reading across the bottom of the screen when the performances is where the story is being told from. So even in the best case scenario, it's not what film was designed for. If you look and you're watching the story and you're watching a human face and the mouth isn't matching the audio, there's somewhere deep within your psyche is kind of a trust thing. And if you're trying to suspend people in a story and you're trying to take them on a journey, like losing trust at certain points, which is where this mouth is not matching up, I think it's what puts a lot of audiences off. And again, it's no fault of the brilliantly skilled people who have been doing dubbing and subbing for a long time. But I think like with everything, technology comes in and it evolves things and it allows the same people who have been doing the dubbing and the subtitling to be able to have new tools to do what they do better, which is what we're ultimately bringing here. You know, we're allowing the same people who work in localization, which is, you know, the general broad term for uh, this way of localizing content. We're giving them new tools. What was the first film that you used this tech on? Uh, there was a movie called Fall, which we changed lines of dialogue and we changed some swear words out. Now we're stuck on this stupid tower in the middle of nowhere. And I don't blame you. And now we're stuck on this stupid stuck on this stupid freaking tower in the middle of freaking nowhere. It was one of Scott's movies, actually. He wrote it and directed it, produced it. Um, and uh, it was an R, it got an R rating in the US. And the only option for it to get a wide release in summer of 2022 was when Lionsgate said, we absolutely love this movie, but it's an R rated movie and it's not going to play um widely for uh, you know the holiday audience we said we'll take the swear words out we'll change some dialogue we'll alter it you know we'll in it sensitively and you know whilst retaining the style of the original actors and everything that we do within our technologies and, and in one week we turned it around and then it became a pg movie which got a wide release then it that enabled it because of the wide release and awareness it got it into netflix and then it became a netflix number one movie and it was you might have seen it it was the uh, two ladies on top of a tower stuck on top of a tower and that would have been a movie that most likely would never have really many people would have been aware of but it ended up going like around the world i think it was five or six countries it became a number one netflix movie and it's all my fault what kind of responsibility is involved with using this kind of tech in the film industry maybe whether well, the thrust of your uh, com your question is along the lines of uh, artistic rights and commercial data ownership rights. Um, and we knew from the beginning, or our opinion was, and it seems to be playing out that way, that you, you can't create new art from existing art, or you can't create new data from existing data without understanding how to attribute to the original data or the original art. So we built technologies, art, the artistic rights treasury that's a fundamental part of our platform 
um, that allows for an understanding to where appropriate ask for consent, where appropriate give compensation. But ultimately, it's a mechanism that can attribute to the understanding that any AI model that has been created, understanding to attribute to the original uh, the original data that it was formed from. What's involved in like training the models to get the outcome that you want? Our product has got a number of uh, AI models that sit within it that are all clean models uh, in the way that we've described of how we go about ensuring that. Um, and that product essentially uses the data of our customer, but only the project that they give us, so a movie, then the final movie. And it uses that movie as the training material so it keeps it in a kind of nice sensible sort of uh, bucket if you like or you know within certain parameters that world biggest entertainment companies in the world to reliably and trustworthy way use these kind of products